Sunday. It's a great day to serve the Lord. Welcome to Hope Today. We are so glad you've joined us. We've got a great program in store for you. I'm Tom Hollis. I'm here with Sydney Goldman and Amanda Brocker. Sydney, tell us what's coming up. Well, you know, we're really excited because, you know, now more than ever, the state of urban education is coming to light. With the rise of violence, crime, and poverty in our city schools, these issues impact students and teachers. And today you're going to hear how a Christian school in one of Pittsburgh's most impoverished communities is not only providing a solution, but also bringing hope. So I'm really excited to hear about the testimony and the story. It's going to be about Amani Christian Academy. You definitely want to stay tuned for that because it's so important to hear how God is moving in the midst of these circumstances circumstances in these situations that students are facing. And speaking of things that students are facing, I just want to share a quick little story that on Sunday I was coming back from church and I was went to Point Spark, uh, State Point Park, uh, Point State, State Park. Park. <laughs> I got a little there tongue tied there. Went to Point State Park and I was walking and right Amanda in the middle of, you know, where the three rivers meet. Um, I saw there was a group of students and they were speaking Spanish and God said, go over and ask them where they're from. So I said, donde eres? I know un poquito, a little bit of Spanish. And they said, they're from Argentina. They're from Buenos Aires. And they're just here for the summer at Point State Park, Univer Point Park University. And they're here for a summer camp. And they actually, Amanda, they did a little dance for us. They're, some, they're Christian. So take a quick Quick look at this video. to Melina and all of them. They are Christians. She had a bracelet on that of Jesus. And so we prayed together. It was awesome, Amanda. I just love how God brings us all together as one in Christ. Something about that river in Pittsburgh, you know, it's point, drawing yeah. people and there's so much prayer that's been going. So I just love that God's bringing people from around the world to that place and that you had that divine appointment. Amazing. God is so faithful. I know. I love that. Well, we have uh, something that we talked about on Friday, but something to rejoice with you. And that is the incredible overturning of Roe v. Wade, as you I'm um, sure have heard about on the news. Uh, you know, it, it is, is something that for so long, there's been such, guys, I have to share something. This is a, a book called Rebirth of America that I've had on my bookshelf, or I don't know if it's been this exact copy, but I've had a copy since 1986 is when this came out. Just a quote from Ronald Reagan in here struck me. It said, we cannot diminish the value of one category of human life, the unborn, without diminishing the value of all human life. There is no cause more important. And just to think about that, Amanda, that that was from 1986 and the battle that has gone on for the unborn all these years to finally see this day. That's right. And I, I just, I believe our work is not over. I Absolutely. think that, you know, for the church, for those of us who know people uh, walking through and they're, you know, like, what am I going to do? I'm pregnant. The worst thing we can do in that moment is judge someone That's on the right. decisions that they made. We better be the ones saying, you know what? God loves you. God has a plan for that child. Let me do life with you. Let's do this together. I, I, we as a church have to change our mindset and uh, not judge people. I, I think over the years we've done a great job of that and people have run from that. You know, like oh, it's the unforbidden sin, you know, and so they run and they would have an abortion. And even families would promote that in the past. I know my friend Jane Abate, she had three abortions during her college years. She was, uh, came from a Catholic family and that was accepted by her parents to have wow. an abortion. So we've got to rework some things, I think, in our own minds of what we think about that. And, you know, said God is the author of life. I mean, it is him. And for us to decide that we want to play God and take a life. Wow. I, d I feel the weightiness of that. And I, I don't, I don't want to disobey God. You know, one thing I think like one of my spiritual moms said, like she, that God was really putting in her heart is that, which was really speaking is that we got work to do. This is just mm -hmm. the beginning. And so yes, we're celebrating, but really now it's boots on the ground. It's, we have to figure out solutions, pray to God and seek his face of what to do because this is dividing our nation. We knew this was going to happen. And I think even too, you know, I just see there, I have fam like I have people on both sides of the aisle. And so I've heard both perspectives and they're both Christians and non-Christians. And so my heart is in the midst of this 
is at first that we would be enlightened, that first that we would understand the root of it, of just how it's like birthed out of racism. The moment I heard that, for me, I remember being in college and, you know, there was, I, at first, I never really heard about abortion until I got into college and there was like protests on my campus and there was, and I was like, what in the world is going on? But it was just in that moment I just started seeking God and asking him. And for me, yes, I'm, I'm against, I don't believe, like I'm not for abortion, but I do believe it's so important for those who, if you're on the other side of the aisle and you're like, I don't understand why they're celebrating because women should have a choice for their bodies. And I completely understand your viewpoint, where you're coming from, but I just encourage you to reach out to somebody on the other side. Let's have conversations. Let's dive into it. Let's get into the root of it and understand the spiritual root. When I started understanding the spiritual root of things, that's when my mindset started changing and shifting. I have people that are very close to me that have had abortions and they'll tell you the atrocity and the horror, the horror and even the PTSD that they suffer from it. So this is a much bigger issue than just like everything that it's being so politicized, but we need to get down to it. It's about life and we need to understand the spiritual root, the spiritual foundations of things because, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. This isn't a wrestle against pro-life or pro-choice. No, it's about the, the enemy is trying to really come in and steal life in our understanding. So Tom and Amanda, that's just my heart with all of it, that there's truly work to do. And I'm just so thankful for all the pregnancy centers that are boots on the ground, saving lives, helping mothers, helping families. And you know, another thing I just want to touch on, somebody said that is an issue, is that the adoption process in America, it's easier to adopt the process internationally than domestically. That's a big problem. So I think that's the next thing is we got to have our laws change that we're able to adopt children here in America so that we can bring them into our families a lot easier. I think you're both hitting on, on a very important part of all this is that Yes, we have to stand for life, and we should stand for life, and life should be preeminent, and that we should protect the unborn. Now that, that Roe v. Wade's overturned, there's a different kind of uh, mentality, a different, a different battleground, and I hate even using that word because that's a political, a part of a political uh, idea, is that there's a battle going on, but to build bridges to the uh, to a people, to especially think of the areas the church has to minister now, as they always have. One of the straw men arguments is you don't care about the baby after it's born. Uh, uh, Tiffany, who was Tiffany Gilbert, who was here on Friday, showed that their uh, center is caring for moms and helping to care for, and, and also um, Bill Themilaris, Pastor Themilaris' wife, I forget her first Lynn. name. Lynn shared on that video that you did on Friday about uh, Love for Two, where they have the mother, uh, they have ways of ministering to the mother and child. We need to be there, church. We need to be that, that this is a brand, it's not brand new, I keep saying that, but it's a new opening in that area to say, we love your baby, we love you. Here's what we can do to help. So let's be a part of, the, of that solution, Amanda. Amen. Well, right now, let's turn to God's word. And he says in Psalms 139, 13 to 16, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book and every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I'm telling you, those words, when I think about every child that never had the opportunity, and it was by a human choice, it wasn't by God's choice, it was by human choice to take that life. But God is saying, I know that person, that, that, that's a baby in there. It's real. This isn't something like I, I believe in choice, that yes, God gives us this free will, this choice. But there, that baby, I love Tiffany Gilbert's ministry of the voices of the unborn because that child can't talk yet. Therefore, it's not a child. No, it is. And God knew that child in the mother's womb. I, it speaks volumes isn't to me. Isn't it great that God encapsulates the and everything from the, our beginning in our mother's womb all the way to where we eventually end up in, as following him. He, he sees that all. He sees your brokenness. He sees that if, if, you, if you're born to a single mom or something, he sees her fear and her wondering and her concern. And he loves you. He's loved you from the very moment of conception, of the very moment of your existence until now. He loves you. And he has a, a plan and a purpose for you. And he has a 
care and love for you and he has so much healing for you. Uh, if, if you're in that situation, reach out right now. Our prayer line is uh, on the screen and you can just uh, reach out to a prayer partner and get some prayer because God loves you today. Sid. Yeah, you know, I love that one part of the scripture in Psalm 139 which says, every day of my life was recorded in your book. That's the promise that we can stand on. And when we come back in about 60 seconds, stay tuned with us because we're going to be talking about changing lives in one of Pittsburgh's most impoverished neighborhoods. You're going to hear about the story of Imani Christian Academy and hear from the head of school, Paulo Nozambi. We'll be right back right after this. Did you know that you can walk in the joy God gives every day? No matter your earthly circumstances, joy is always available to you through Christ. Always. Why? Because Jesus is the object of your joy and He is always with you. We want you to experience daily joy. So with the help of our own Anna Fry, we've created a 21-day devotional simply titled Living Joyfully. In it, we'll look at Paul's letter to the Philippians and study how he lived out joy in the midst of suffering. Use this 21-day devotional as a tool to help you meditate daily on scriptures pertaining to joy. Combine that with prayer for a joy boost in your life. Request a copy of Living Joyfully with your best gift. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for giving to Cornerstone Television. Hidden in the East Hills, there's a school serving as a beacon of hope for some of the most vulnerable youth in Pittsburgh. For nearly 30 years, the Monte Christian Academy has provided quality educational and an emotional support system to students living in and around the underserved community. To talk more about Amani's impact and the story, the Academy CEO and head of school, Paulo Nuzambi is joining us today. Paulo, we're so grateful to have you with us well, today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate all that you're doing to make an impact in the East Hills. And before we get into the story, of Amani Christian Academy. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and the God story of actually how he brought you to the school? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, my parents are immigrants to the United States. They were from Luanda, Angola, west coast of Africa. My dad was a part-time minister and during that period in the 70s, um, you know, being a minister was not something that the government looked favorably upon. So um, they would imprison my father from time to time and ultimately they decided, my parents, that they couldn't stay in their native country. They had to flee. And they took me and at the time my three other brothers and started traveling the world seeking a place where they could raise their children to live in an environment where they were free to worship the God that they loved, obtain a quality education and become everything God intended them to be. And ultimately that led us to the United States. Um, once we arrived here, we really took advantage of every opportunity. God opened doors in amazing ways. Um, I was able to go to undergraduate school. I went to graduate school here. I was a lawyer for 13 years. I was a nonprofit executive. And then at some point, I had an opportunity. I was invited to come and work for Imani Christian Academy. And it was an amazing story. Literally, my job that I had been working ended at 9 a.m. On, on that morning. And I was sitting there contemplating, like, what, what does God have in store for me next? What, what's the next thing that I'm going to do? But, you know, when a job ends, you're, you're sort of at, you know, you, you don't know. You're, you're asking all these questions and more questions than there are answers. And at 2 p.m. on the same day, I received the call. And it was from the, uh, head, it was from the uh, head of the board, the chair of the board, inviting me to come and take a look at Imani Christian Academy. They said, we heard you might be available and you know, we, we, we wanted to get to you before anybody else would. And so that really began the journey that was a relatively short one that led me to Imani. Yeah. yeah. Wait, wait, wait a minute, so they heard at two o'clock, you had been laid off at nine o'clock and hadn't told anybody, right? And they, boy, Pittsburgh's a big, small town, isn't it? it the is. word gets around fast. It is. <laughs> it happened so fast. I, I, I remember taking the call and thinking, I haven't even told my wife yet, <laughs> you know? Like, she hasn't received the news. So it was, it, it was clearly a God moment, you yeah, know? Exactly. For me, it was, sure. it was God definitively directing me to my next assignment. And that's how I've always viewed my work at Imani Christian Academy with all the folks there. It is a Christian mission. We are called to do work in that part of the city to serve that population, that community. And, and that's how we very much pursue um, the work of education through uh, a Christian mission perspective. 
I love it so much that you were called, you're on assignment for Imani Christian Academy. And you know, some of the people in the city of Pittsburgh have heard of Imani, but for those who don't know the story and the background, really the miracle, can you share the story of Imani? Yeah, Imani was really birthed out of um, Bishop Clay's vision of uh, you know, what he wanted to do at a critical time um, in the early 1990s. As some people know, in the 1990s, the African American community was really struggling. There was a great deal of violence, drug proliferation, gangs, and many young lives were simply being lost. Innocent lives were being lost. And Bishop Clay at that time found himself burying a lot of young men. And he was convicted. He realized through the Holy Spirit that he was encountering these young lives too late at a point where he was no longer able to share the gospel truth with them, right? To impact their lives in a meaningful way. And he, he was given this vision of a school literally designed to save lives, to intervene in the lives of children where they weren't necessarily going to school, they weren't doing well in school, but a school that would first and foremost love them and allow them to understand that God loved them. And in so doing, bring them back to life and lead them into a new future. One that was filled with hope, one that was filled with brightness, one that was dramatically different in many instances from the one that they had been experiencing before. And that really birthed the Monty Christian Academy, a school where you, know, you, you could come in and you would recognize people from your own community. You would recognize, they would know and understand your story so you didn't have to explain. You know, there were people there who loved God and were unabashed about making sure that you knew as a student that God loved you, had a purpose and a plan for your life, and it was their reason for being there to help guide you on that purpose walk. And so Imani really began from now those humble beginnings and it grew and grew and ultimately it's in a school now in the East Hills and we attract many, many more students than we did before. Um, eventually, you know, Imani had this reputation for being compassionate, kind, caring and nurturing. But we also developed a, 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 a sort of brand of education that really appealed to people because it was Christian based, right? And people said, that's what I want for my child. And so more and more people began to bring their students to Imani Christian Academy, not necessarily because they were struggling in school, but because Imani was a better fit for their value system. Imani was offering things that they weren't getting in other places. They felt at home at Imani. And so ultimately it grew to the school that it is now. We have about 150 students currently, and um, we're there in the East Hill serving the same community of folks. Yeah. So incredible. And Imani, it means faith in yes. Swahili, which is really powerful. And so, Paulo, can you just talk to us a little bit about some of the testimonies that you have seen? Because I don't think a lot of people understand if you've ever driven through the East Hills of Pittsburgh, my goodness, it's just like the, the impoverishment, there's single moms, there's so much going on. Can you just talk about the climate of the school, what the students are caring and dealing with, and the miracles that you have seen God just moving in the midst and despite of their circumstances, how education is helping to elevate them and guide them on a, a brighter absolutely, path? Absolutely. Well, you know, it, it's difficult at times to drive through the community and oftentimes, you know, there are areas where you see dilapidated homes, boarded up um, windows, weeds growing in yards. Um, there's definitively areas and pockets of Pittsburgh where the economic revitalization that has touched many other communities has not touched these communities. And you realize that it's, it's more than just the vision of these homes um, in disrepair. It's more than just broken sidewalks. It's, it's broken dreams and failed promises, right? It's the reality that young people are going to grow up in an environment that suggests to them that there's a real limit on their God-given capacity, right? That their dreams are being diminished by an environment that suggests that there's not that much available to them. And then you, you realize that that's why we're there. That's why Imani has been situated and strategically placed where it is. We are adjacent to a subsidized housing um, um, development. Um, we are in a community that has been historically underserved. And I, I say historically because it's more than just a generation. Like it's been generations that the same groups of people have been in this community struggling to survive. And Imani really represents a beacon of hope. I have seen so many people come to Imani and uh, you know, now we've been there almost 30 years. So we've got parents 
whose children now come to Imani. We've had grandparents who taught at Imani, whose grandchildren come to Imani. So it, it's extraordinary to see how God has been working transgenerationally. And the stories that you hear of young people who came to Imani who in their former schools, they were branded as troubled children or problem children, children who couldn't learn, who didn't have capacity. And they came to Imani and they were introduced to people who said, that is not how God sees you. God sees you as fearfully and wonderfully made. God sees you as imbued with purpose. God has given you capacity and that's what we're going to speak to and see the transformation in these children. See them come to believe in themselves and understand that how God sees them is how they should see themselves and what it does to transform not only their academic capacity but their view of what's possible in the world right? To realize that there's a world beyond their neighborhood. There are opportunities beyond what they've seen. And knowing that Imani has been strategically placed in such a position to help guide them along that way. You know, young people who came and literally, you know, there's a story of a young man who, you know, thanks to, you know, some of our sports teams, they really wrap around, you know, young men and women who play sports. And literally, uh, the story goes that, he, the first day that he went to football practice, one of his best friends was shot. And, you know, upon, and upon graduation, um, one of the mothers would uh, come to the coach who was instrumental in getting him engaged in, in, in the sports and said to him, you know, you, you changed, you, you saved my son's life. And his understanding was like, you, you know, we, we collectively have helped. And she says, no, you don't understand. If he hadn't been at practice that day, he probably would have been standing right next to his friend who lost his life. So the way God intervenes through what is available in a school, whether it be athletics, whether it be you know, academic programs, whether it be enrichment opportunities, is extraordinary, is extraordinary. So being a school that serves the underserved, you know, our greatest desire is number one, to impart the love of God and the gospel truth to our children. Right? Number two, to equip them educationally for life that exists beyond Imani Christian Academy. And number three, to make sure that we equip them to spread the good news themselves, to let other people know what God has done for them through Imani Christian Academy. Hearing just the story and the testimony about what God is doing in the midst of the darkness, there's a beacon of hope, a beacon of light, and it's Amani Christian Academy. I know we just have like 10 seconds left. Is there anything that you specifically need prayer for for your school? We know it's like summertime right now, yeah. the school years are quickly approaching. So, what can we as a family pray for you? We need prayer for resources. You know, doing this work is one that constantly requires, you know, every year we begin the year and we are, we, we are challenged in our faith walk. We say, do we have enough to make it through? And we raise the money every year. Although we, we charge a modest tuition, really, we raise the money to keep the school going. So prayers for resources um, so that we don't have to continue to brag about doing so much with so little for students who need so much more is what we really need. Yeah, that would be wonderfully helpful. Thank you so much for sharing the story, the miracles of Monty Christian Academy, and thank you for all that you're doing and your whole teachers and your staff and everyone that is truly making an impact on students' lives. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll be right back in about a minute, and we're going to speak to your spirit and encourage your heart. We'll be right back. Can you imagine Tens of thousands of people from all across the city coming together simply to pray. Every generation has an opportunity to witness the goodness of God filling their city. Our generation right now is desperate for something good. We're desperate for unity. We want everyone to have the opportunity to witness God, to witness His glory being made real amongst us. I know you're blessed. I've been blessed sitting here learning about Imani. And I just want to ask you, Paula, a question about identity. Because I see these kids and, you know, a lot of our public school systems, they're, they're, they're telling them, you know, you have one of 72. Who, who are you? But what is different about your school? Well, we are unabashedly Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and we are unapologetically Christian. And what that means is we rest on the Bible. We rest on the truth of God's word and what he says about us. 
And so what we, you know, convey to our students is that God has made you in a definitive and unique way according to his plan. You know, he is not confused about your identity at all. He, he knew you, like you said, before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knows every hair upon your head. He has a plan for you. He brought you here to prosper you and not to harm you, right? And so you have to understand that God's plan for you is clear, right? And the best place that you can be in this is in the center of his will, right? And that means identifying yourself as God's child. And the world around you will tell you that you're a million different things. God knows who you are. And if you know God, what's most important is understanding how he defines you as his child. Yeah. Praise God. All I can say is I know there's grandparents and parents out there and they're like, how do we find out about your school? Like what, what would be their best avenue? ImaniChristianAcademy.org is our website. You can always call 412-731-7982. Um, that's the number to the school. Um, we are a, a unique school in some sense. We have um, an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school all in one building. Yeah. And so if you're looking for a school to serve your educational needs for your children, um, we're there. We're there. And what yeah. about if there's uh, people that would like to donate to your school? I'm sure we bring on those funds. We <laughs> absolutely. Help absolutely. Um, on our website, on the very first page, there's a donate button. Um, and you can always um, call the school and reach out to our development director, Barbara um, Nicholas. She's there. Um, and, you know, w in whatever way you want to help, we'll be more than willing, uh, willing to accept the assistance. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We, will have, uh, we will have links to those websites and phone numbers. All of, we'll put all that on, our, on a, a link on our website at ctvn.org. And uh, I, I said, I just think that this is what we're talking about, God's plan, God's purpose, God's identity in us as we really, as we really are. Yeah, it's time for us to step out of ourselves and to help one another. I know before the break we said, hey, we're going to speak to your spirit. But guess what we are? We're speaking the spirit of your generation and of your legacy of children. There are children here in our area that desperately need us. So for Tay, I just encourage you just to seek God and say, how can I help? How can I be part of the solution? Giving to Amani Christian Academy, loving on the children and the grandchildren, the young people that are in your neighborhoods. There's so many things that we can do. They need us now right. more than ever before. And, and expect the unexpected. Paulo did not expect to be in the situation he is, but he followed after God. God let him. God opened doors. God's going to open doors for you that you don't even know. And it says that no man can shut those. On tomorrow's Hope Today, praising God for his greatness and faithfulness, worship artist Katie Wyrick shares her story of battling anxiety and depression and how she's now shining the light and love of Jesus with her music. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.